We're going to continue to worship. But I want to tell you, I feel his glory and his presence in here this morning. And we're going to roll this. I want the people out there on Facebook and the live stream to worship with us. Because this song right here is what revival is about. It is when God's people want nothing but Jesus. They want Jesus. They want to know him. They want to be in his presence. They want to do his will. They began to hate the world and the things of the world. They began to hate sin and love righteousness and holiness. And all they want to do is draw near to Jesus. This song is revival, folks. If we grasp this, and I can tell you right now, this morning could be the beginning for us because he's here. And we're not going to get in a hurry. And if Facebook cuts it, that's on them. They can give an account to God for that. But we're broadcasting other places. And if they cut it, you can go to denodal.org and watch live. You can go to um, Rumble and watch live. Uh, I don't care. We need to worship the Lord this morning. And this song is it. Really is. Let's do it. Yes, Lord, Let's send your glory. Lord, that's our prayer today. Lord, send your glory, your presence, your power. Lord, we don't want to be dry. We don't want to be empty. We don't want to be dead. Lord, we want your presence in our midst. And Lord, we thank you for being here today. Lord, we pray that you will move mightily throughout this, this nation. Lord, pour out your spirit in a great and mighty way. Lord, we pray here in Opelika and Auburn as well that you will pour out your spirit. Lord, send great revival. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing across the country. I pray this morning that it will go deeper and deeper into your river, Lord. And we thank you for it. We thank you for all that you do. You don't owe us anything, Lord. It's all by your love, your mercy, your grace. We don't earn it. Lord, we certainly aren't holy enough for it or good enough for it. But, Lord, we know that your presence and your glory, it purifies. Lord, you, you come and you wash us in your blood and you sanctify us and you give us your fire to purge and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you. And we thank you you didn't leave us alone or to just go through some intellectual exercise, but you sent your Holy Spirit to live and dwell, to lead and guide, to teach us, to fill us, and to move through us with power and signs and wonders. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. We are not getting in a hurry. Because I have to cover what I need, have got to cover today. So I'm just going to let you know. We're going to be here for a minute. All right. Um, what I've entitled this this morning and this is so very important where we're going. And I will say this, be praying because we absolutely are going to need a new, uh, larger spot here. Uh, we really already needed it. If, like I said before, if everybody shows up at church here on Sunday morning, we're running out of seats. And I am expecting that we're going to have a whole lot more happening. So we're going to find something quickly, maybe even rent something to use for a short-term basis but we are definitely going to have to move out of here for Sunday mornings. Um, I've entitled this this morning, The Asbury Revival and the River of God. And, um, you know, I shared last week how I spent a lot of time at the Brownsville Revival in the 90s and other revivals that broke off, you know, broke out because of that time period, really the, the early 90s to the early 2000s there was really a kind of a season of revival. God was moving. Uh, he was moving in, wasn't just Pentecostal and charismatic churches. It was Methodist churches and Baptist churches and uh, Presbyterian churches. God was just moving and people were responding to that. Um, and let me just go on and say, and I'm going to talk about this this morning too, understanding the balance. We, we have two extremes in the church world. We have the extreme that says, 
that God doesn't speak today. He doesn't move by his spirit today. There's no miracles today. The gifts of the spirit ceased. The nine gifts of the spirit ceased uh, when the word of God was finalized, when the canon was finalized. All this kind of nonsense is taught in seminaries and, uh, you know, it's taught in churches across the country. You've got that extreme error, by the way. And then in on the other side, you've got the charismatic and Pentecostals who um, moved away from waiting on God for the for the real move of the Holy Spirit. And many of them, like Todd Bentley and Bob Jones and a lot of that whole movement there, they call the the NRA, whatever, uh, or the NAR, I should say, New Apostolic Reformation. They, they, uh, uh, yeah, I went to a Bama Carey meeting yesterday, so it's in my head. Um, but, <laughs> but the, this other side, and the reason that there's such a counterfeit, and, and Todd Bentley, bless his darling heart, um, the reason, and he really truly believes he operates in the, in the real thing, and he really believes that. But I wrote this book, Polluted Church, back in 2000. God made me write this. I didn't want to write this book just because I was too busy. He didn't want, and I didn't want to disobey. But this book that I wrote, The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City. Now, think about this. I dealt with this after being a part of the Brownsville Revival, uh, seeing the good and the bad, um, seeing why, and you know, being a student of revival history for the last 35 years, that's one of the subjects I've studied a lot. Um, in every revival and every move of God, the counterfeit tries to creep in, okay? Um, the counterfeit crept into the Pentecostal and charismatic world real big 20 years ago, you, should, you could say, 30 years ago. You could really go back even to the Jesus movement because the Catholics came in um, and when the, you accept the Roman Catholic Church in your midst, you're accepting all kinds of idolatry and error. But the real sneaky culprit that got into many Pentecostal and charismatic churches, and now not just Pentecostal and charismatic, but Baptist and Methodist churches now, is this thing that I cover in here called contemplative mysticism. Now, what contemplative mysticism is, is basically Hindu, Buddhist prayer techniques visualization, ma saying mantras or saying words and phrases over and over again to blank out the mind. Uh, lect Lecto Divina is a Catholic thing about imagining yourself in the story of the Bible, putting your, like reading a story and then creating a whole motion picture in your head that you're in, right, and you're there, and all this stuff. All of this using of the imagination, visualization, mantra, repetitive prayers like the rosary, um, but now they, now they call it contemplative or centering prayer. Um, but these folks ended up, Bob Jones, the prophet that Todd Bentley was mentored by, was deep into this stuff. And Todd Bentley teaches this stuff. And I document it all in the book at how they got off into contemplative mysticism. So the signs that they have from tongues to a lot of the falling on the floor, um, which is not a bad thing if it's God, but a lot of that, what you see in the Pentecostal and charismatic world is satanic. It's counterfeit. It's demonic because they open the door through contemplative mysticism, okay? Now, I've said this a million times, and I'm going to say it again. Just because some people out there make some really good counterfeit $100 bills, I'm not throwing out all my real $100 bills. You understand? And the balance to this thing, when God moves and when the Holy Spirit moves, is to let him move, not quench him or deny him or resist him. Let him do what he wants to do and just keep an eye on and make sure that Things are not going off in a bad direction because of some bad people with some evil spirits on them working through them, all right? But the answer to, you know, keeping bad spirits and counterfeit out is not throwing out the good and saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you can only do this, but you can't do this. 
See, the moment you do that, and I'm saying this to the Asbury Revival people, the moment you say, God, you're allowed to do this, but you're not allowed to do this, the moment you do that, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. You will eventually grieve the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will move away from you. Okay? But now we've got the other side, because now these are literal things that I had posted on my Facebook page, comments from people, when I started sharing that I was at the Asbury Revival this past week. Well, I sure hope they're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking other tongues so that they can be saved. I had numerous people come on my page and say that, oh, it's not a real revival unless they're speaking in tongues. Folks, that is about as idiotic as the day is long. Can I say it one more time as someone who has the gift of tongues and speaks in tongues and has the gift of interpretation of tongues? You do not have to speak in tongues to be saved. It is not the sign of tongues is not the final ultimate goal of all things. Okay? Is it an important tool that God has given us, a gift that we need, and there's reasons why we need it? Yes. But the moment you start saying you've got to be speak in tongues or it's not a real revival, you have gone to the other side. Or you say you've got to speak in tongues to be saved. This is ridiculous. Okay? Salvation is first. Salvation, you know, remember, remember in John 20 is, or when Jesus, after he rose from the dead and he appeared to the apostles, and it said he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Remember that? And then he tells them a little while later, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Now, we know what that was. That was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the initial evidence of that baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about and told them to go wait for was the gift of tongues. But that wasn't even the end of it. The gift of tongues is just a doorway. It's a beginning into the rest of the gifts. All right? But when Jesus breathed on the apostles that that, that a time he appeared to them and he said receive the holy spirit that was for regeneration that was for being born again that's when they were born again the supernatural experience they already believed he was the christ the messiah the savior they finally understood the cross and his atoning death and resurrection that they didn't understand the whole time they were walking with him but they understood his atoning death and his resurrection they witnessed. And when he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit for regeneration, for salvation, or what we call being born again. But then he tells them, there's more. Somebody say, there's more. So he tells them, go wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. And they go wait for 10 days. And they pray for 10 days. And, you know, they didn't know it was going to be 10 days. It could have been 90 days. It could have been 500 days. They, the Lord just told him, go wait until you are. And he said, until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, until you are endued with power from on high. Okay? So the born again, saved apostles, and uh, another group, there's 120 total, went and obeyed. And God poured out his spirit, and they spoke in tongues. Okay, supernatural tongues. Now, some people will point out, well, that was just other languages known in the world. Yes, that's part of the gift of tongues where you can never learn Chinese and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit can speak to you and you can speak perfect Chinese. You won't understand it, but you can speak perfect Chinese. I did this in Israel to an Arab taxi driver who wasn't taking me where I needed to go, so I spoke to him in tongues. I don't know what I said to him, but he took me where I was supposed to go. All right? I don't... <laughs> He, he, I guess he, he was trying to get more money out of it, so he's just riding us around in a circle. Um, but there's also, the Bible tells us, there's the, there's the new tongues or unknown tongues. There's the tongues of men and tongues of angels. And Paul talked about unknown, meaning never have been known before. Supernatural that no man can understand. So there's a, there's a gift of tongues. There's a supernatural gift of tongues that's for prayer. It's for intercession. It's for worship. It's to be interpreted as well, to have to be uh, equivalent to the gift of prophecy. But, folks, God can move and move in people and touch people and revive people and refresh people and begin to heal people's broken hearts and draw them and take them deeper 
without the gift of tongues. You hear me? Now, I'm not saying they should reject it or resist it. Maybe they're just not there yet, okay? Now, we went to Asbury. And from what I was watching when we got there, it was pretty much what I expected it to be. Um, let me show you a few pictures if, if you guys didn't see. Um, the, lines were, the lines were crazy when we got there on Tuesday. Uh, they were crazier and crazier. Uh, Jordan was there last night, yesterday all day. And what, how long were you in line? So he's in line for eight hours and happened to get to move ahead by a little quirky thing that happened. But we were there, and it only took about an hour for us to get in. And people are coming out and going in because it's been like it's, it just goes on all day long. So people come out and they go in. All right. Um, I'm going to tell you the most extraordinary thing, and this is what I, I'll say this. You can say what you want about this, whether it's college students or it's whatever. It's, not, it's nothing or it's not, <laughs> it's not that powerful or whatever. But let me tell you what is powerful. The people that keep showing up. It shows that there is a hunger for more than just the dead traditional church services that we see across the country every day. And I'm talking about from your traditional dead churches to your, uh, you know, slick mega churches. People are sick of it. It's leaving them empty, dry, dead uh, and, and discouraged and sometimes confused. I go to church, but I find nothing. People are hungry for a real touch from God. And really, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, every time that there's been dramatic change in my life is when the presence of God has touched me. I felt him. I experienced him. And, folks, a lot of people say, oh, it's just emotional. Oh, will you stop that right there? Yes, there are people who can be in the flesh, and you can say it's emotional. But, folks, if the Holy Spirit of God touches you, you're going to have an emotion. You understand me? You're going to either have extreme joy and peace, feeling his love and his presence, and knowing that he's real and that he loves you and that he's forgiven you and that he's right there. When you realize all that, you're going to either cry or laugh or you know, some people shake, some people fall on the floor, but don't tell me that emotions are bad. We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the soul is the place where the emotions are. It's not wrong to love God with your emotions. It's not wrong to have a reaction to an encounter with Almighty God. All right? Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with these college students coming from all over the place so hungry for God that they're willing to just worship God for hours and hours and hours and hours. That right there ought to tell you at least anything. It's not the devil. It's people hungry for God. They're hungry for God to move in their midst, to touch them, to reveal himself, to speak to them. One of the students that testified when we were there Tuesday night, testified that he didn't believe that God spoke to people anymore because that's the church he grew up in. He didn't believe the Holy Spirit could literally speak to you and show you things. And he had an experience there where God used somebody to speak to him about his mom. And his mom, he said, they said, I know your mom's having a hard day. He called his mom. She said she's had, having the hardest day of her life. This kid was like, God speaks to people? Now, I, 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 I leaned over and said to my wife, he could have found that out in John 16 and John chapter 10. But he, he said, I didn't grow up in a church like this. And what he's talking about, people worshiping God, people hungry for God, people open to the Spirit of God moving and allowing him to move and to speak and to do things through them. He never experienced that. Now, for you and me, Pastor Troy, that's elementary, my dear Watson. We've been experiencing that for a long time. But this kid hadn't. 
So let me tell you what's happening in his life. Revival. Because let me tell you, whenever you encounter God and God reveals himself to you, speaks to you, it starts to, to turn up the volume in your life and you get excited about him. That's revival. That's being revived, refreshed. Remember last week, the definition, recovering of breath. It's like, I haven't been able to breathe, but now I can breathe because I know the one in whom has my breath, who made me. And so these are a bunch of college students that went to dead Methodist churches and dead Presbyterian churches and dead Baptist churches and dead Pentecostal churches. You know, the Pentecostal churches, you know the thing about them, the problem is they have a name that they're alive, but they're dead. That's even worse. They have this reputation. Woo-hoo. They can they can hoop and jump and dance and all this stuff and dead, dead, sin going on. So let me just tell you, as a Pentecostal charismatic minister for many years, I'm sick of them. I don't want Pentecostal pep rallies or charismania. I want the real deal. And sometimes the real deal is not shouting, it's not tongues, it's not falling in the floor, all of which can be of God. Sometimes it's just a gentle breeze. It's just a gentle river. You know, this, this I, I'm going to, I got so much to cover. But there's a verse, let's put, well, let's, I'll show you a couple more pictures. Let's look at this one. We were sitting up, we were in the balcony Thursday afternoon, right near the altar. People are down here praying for folks, laying hands on people. Um, people are going down to get saved and rededicate their lives. You want to tell me it's not of God? College students are all up here on the platform because there's no room for them to sit out here. And they're up there worshiping God. And I watched them worshiping God for hours. I mean, what what, what do you want them to do, Baptist pastor? You'd rather them be at the bar down the road? Then dare sway and worship. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't. Oh, there. uh, You know, one Baptist pastor, I heard him say it. He said, oh, they're, they're, they're singing those charismatic songs. Yep, look out. It's a slippery slope. I'll I'll tell you this. Let me say this, too, though, to all my non-charismatic Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Have you ever noticed that when there's a revival, there's a move away from your dead, stale church services? There's a move away from empty prayer meetings. There's a move away from Calvinism, always. You say, oh, no, there was great revivals under Calvinists. Yeah, there were some rev- revivals under Calvinist preaching when they weren't preaching like Calvinists. But that's another story. Let's go. <laughs> it's like this. It's been like this right here t- nearly 24-7. Now, you know, through the night, it would get slimmer and down. But during the day, from the morning until evening, until late at night. And and this place will be full, and there'll be a line outside down the block, down through two or three blocks. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, you know, is this even close to what the Brownsville revival was in the sense of God's glory and presence? No, not even a tenth. The only thing similar is the lines. Blow your mind to see church, people standing in line for hours to get into church. That just, again, shows hunger. But is God moving there? Yes, he is. Did I feel any evil spirits in the place while I was there? And I have the, the, the gift of discerning spirits. No, I did not. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody there is perfect. There may be even a few homosexuals in the midst. And some people are accusing that they're letting homosexuals lead it. I I don't believe that. But here's the deal. Even if some people are in sin that are within the revival, you're hoping that they get touched by God, convicted of their sin, repent of their sin. You want people 
there that need forgiveness, that need the blood of Jesus, that need to be saved, or that, that prodigals that need to get the sin out of their life. I mean, if we think for a second that all that a revival is going to be nice and tidy and neat and just the way we think it ought to be in every way, you're crazy. Because people are coming from all kind of different directions, not just places, but just from different spiritual places. And, and they're looking. They're looking for God. They're looking for help, a lot of them. They're looking for the truth. They're looking for real. And, and you know, we were talking about it on the way here. Look, if, if there happens to be some homosexuals that won't repent, that end up lead in, worship, like, what is it, 10 worship teams? I don't even know how many they got. It just seemed like there was one after the other. It's not that people in sin, people in fornication, people in adultery, people in all kinds of sin get into a revival. The question is, if the leaders find out that somebody's leading worship and they're in sin and won't repent, how are they going to respond to that? And we don't know yet. And maybe they have. Maybe they will. I'm not in charge of it. You get what I'm saying? I don't know everything that's going on. And there's no way, unless you're there every day, all day, you don't know everything that's going on. So stop being Mr. Armchair Quarterback. <laughs> and that's another thing. I thought, you know, the reason we went, number, there's several reasons why I knew that we should go. Number one, you really shouldn't talk about something you hadn't witnessed yourself. Right? I mean, you should have some thorough knowledge of it, best you can. Second of all, there were all kind of varying reports, so it's like, let's go see ourselves. Secondly, I am not too prideful. I will go to any church. I'll go to a Baptist church, a Methodist church, an Anglican church. I don't care what it is. If God is really moving there and a revival's there, and I go there and sense the Spirit of God's moving, I'm there to say, Lord, I know I don't have it all. It doesn't have to come through me. I'm hungry for you. I want you. I want to be touched by you. I want to experience this. And I'm humbling myself to drive seven, eight hours and say, Lord, revive me. Touch me. Help me. I want to go deeper. And if you're moving here, I'm not, I don't care if they're Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal. I don't care if you're moving here. Touch me. Change me. Fill me. Anoint me, I receive. And the Lord told me some things. He spoke to me very clearly when I was there. One thing I cannot say right now. Another thing, though, he showed me on Thursday afternoon was probably the best time we had because we got there about 4 o'clock and stayed past 7, I think 7.30 or so. And that was just a very anointed time. But again, the whole time, was there any preaching while we were there for, for three and a half hours? Not a word. All worship time. All right? Some of you start getting antsy in here if we go past 30 minutes. <laughs> you better get free from that. All right? Now, back in the old days, Pentecostal churches, worship was at least an hour. Minimum. No, no. No, uh, I've been to Africa. African time is what we called it. <laughs> They'll say the meeting starts at 7. People are trickling in at 7, but nothing started till 9 or 10 p.m., so uh, for real. Um, let's roll through a couple more here. This is on the first day. This is the building, Hughes Memorial Auditorium. This is where it is, built in 1890. This is a beautiful campus, by the way. It was a Methodist campus. It's named after uh, Francis Asbury, who John Wesley sent here to establish the Methodist Church in America. Um, but beautiful old buildings. I love old buildings. You can keep going. Now, I want to I read here, as we get into this, the definition of revival here from Finney. All right. Now, how, who knows who Charles Finney is? What? Only a handful of people. Charles G. Finney, Charles Grandison Finney, um, he was a Presbyterian that uh, he was a lawyer going to a Presbyterian church and was not born again. 
And the people of the Presbyterian Church kept, that he went to kept he was he kind of he was studying to be a lawyer and he was just a very intelligent man and he loved to mock them because he thought it was all ridiculous. And um, anyway, they were praying for him and he got powerfully born again. He had a powerful encounter with God. Now, not a lot of people know this because they don't read history. They don't read about Finney. But sometime after that, not too long after that, Finney experienced a very powerful baptism in the Holy Spirit where he said that the unutterable gushings came out of him, the gift of tongues. A lot of people don't know that John Wesley taught about the gift of tongues as well and the power of it, all right? People fell out in John Wesley's meetings. They fell out on the floor. They shrieked. They fainted. They swooned, as they said back then. They swooned. Uh, <laughs> um, but Finney led, he was probably the, I would say he was the spearhead. He wasn't the only revivalist of the 1800s, but he was the spearhead of the Second Great Awakening that spread across the whole country. Pretty much everywhere he went, there was revival. For instance, he went and, and started a meeting in Rochester, New York in around 1830, 31, somewhere in that time period. Rochester, New York begins preaching. I think they only like set up to go for a week, but he was always ready to go as long as God wanted to go for his meetings. Ended up staying there preaching for six months, and 100,000 people were dramatically converted. They said not, we're not talking about people that just said, oh, sign the card, and I'm, I'm a member now of the Baptist Church or the Presbyterian Church. No converted 100,000 they said it changed Rochester New York for decades after that all right um this is similar to what happened in the Welsh revival in 1904 God gave Evan Roberts a 26 year old young man a vision of 100,000 people getting saved when they started the meetings there was 19 people in the meeting 26 in the second meeting by the second week the church was overflowing and people were outside by six months, there was 100,000 people converted. And we're talking about hardcore. This was a, a mining, a coal mining community in Wales where most all of the men went, got their money and pay from working in the mines and went and spent it all on drinking and getting drunk for, for weeks on end, binges, and would come home with nothing for their wives and children. No food. They wouldn't get buy food for their families and, or proper clothing. And these are the kind of people that got saved by the thousands. So much so that the, the judges would wear white gloves because crime be didn't exist anymore. Think about it. They had no cases to try. That's how converted Wales. And some say, some scholars and experts on, on historians say that, that somewhere around probably 250,000 people in that region, in that area. And Wales is a small area got saved because of the Welsh revival. So Charles Finney would go and have revivals like this. For instance, the anointing was so strong on this man that he went to a town to have a revival. And one of the church members ran a factory or owned a factory that had like two or 3,000 workers in this factory. And so they asked Finney if he would just come look at the factory. So they're just going to take him on a tour. Well, two of the women that were working in the factory looked at him and started kind of talking to each other and laughing at and mocking him, the preacher. He says, I just looked at them with a solemn, serious look. That's all I did. He said, the Holy Spirit of conviction came upon them. He said, I didn't say a word. Nobody said a word. The Holy Spirit sp spread through the whole factory. It was so bad, the conviction of sin, the people weeping and moaning and groaning, trembling over their sin, that they came out, the superintendents of the factory came out and shut the factory down and said, it's more important that we tend to our souls than this factory keep running. Everybody in the factory got saved. This is before the revival meeting started. That's, that's Charles Finney. Charles Finney was also a great teacher. I'll tell you this much. Charles Finney... If it hadn't been for Charles Finney, we would have probably been a lot further down the road of getting rid of slavery. He spearheaded in his revivals, and he traveled all over the country, vehemently opposed slavery as 
is wicked, sinful, and immoral. And then when he became president of Overland College, he was the first college president in college to allow a black woman to come in and get a diploma from his school, and he caught hell for it. I'm just trying to give you an idea of who the man is, okay? He was a brilliant man. He wrote a book called Revival Lectures. It's this thick, right, about what a revival is, when it can be expected, on all aspects of what you should and should not do, right? You want to stop a revival, quench the Holy Spirit, here's what you do, right? So his definition, and we're going to read this this morning, his definitions of what a revival is. Y'all ready? We read it. What is a revival by Charles Finney? It presupposes that the church is sunk down in a backslidden state, and a revival consists in the return of the church from her backslidings and the conversion of sinners. Number one, he says, the fountains of sin need to be broken up. A revival always includes conviction of sin. This is when people feel completely miserable about the sin in their life. They, are, they feel the guilt, the shame, the pain. They feel the, the, the separation from God because of it. They feel the weight of eternal judgment that they're going to stand before God to give an account of it. It is not a pleasant feeling, but it is a must in the process. You've got to get to a point where you understand the wages of sin is eternal damnation. And you hate it, and you don't want it anymore. And he says here that the, a revival always includes conviction of sin on part of the church. Backslidden professors cannot wake up and begin right away in the service of God without deep searchings of heart. The fountains of sin need to be broken up. In a true revival, Christians are always brought under such conviction. Did he say unsaved people? He said Christians are always brought under such conviction, conviction they see their sins in such a light that often they find it impossible to maintain a hope of their acceptance with God. So he's saying that in a true revival, the Holy Spirit will move upon Christians, backslidden, lukewarm Christians, that will begin to realize, I'm not once saved, always saved, no matter how I live. Oh, and Charles Finney was vehemently against that false doctrine. And he says it does not always go to that extent. He said, but there are always in genuine revival, deep convictions of sin and often in cases of abandoning of all hope. Okay. He goes on to say a revival is a new beginning of obedience with God. He says, just as in the case of the converted sinner, the first step is a deep repentance, a breaking down of heart, a getting down into the dust before God with humility and a forsaking of sin. Now, we're hearing at Asbury that people are confessing their sins. They're under conviction. They're going down, confessing their sins, and that people, and there's repentance, okay? I, it's hard to tell what people are talking about or doing down there. I don't know. I didn't hear, I mean, I heard some testimonies, but again, we'll see how deep it goes. But this is, this is his definition. Now, let's keep going. Let's go to number three. Backslidden Christians will be brought to repentance. A revival is nothing else than, oh, well, I just read that, didn't I? Number four, I meant Christians will have their faith renewed. Now, this is an important step here because sometimes our faith gets a little tired and old and weak, right? He says, while they are in a backslidden state, they are blind to the state of sinners. Their hearts are hard as marble. The truths of the Bible appear like a dream. They admit it to all to be true. Uh, their conscience and their judgment is sent to it, but their faith does not see it standing out in bold relief in all the burning realities of eternity. But when they enter into revival, they no longer see men as trees walking, but they see things in that strong light which will, new, will, new, which will renew the love of God in their hearts. This will lead them to labor zealously to bring others to him. They will feel grieved that others do not love God when they love him so much, and they will set themselves feelingly to persuade their neighbors to give him their hearts so that their love to men will be renewed. They will be filled with a tender and burning love for souls. They will have a longing desire for the salvation of the whole world. They will be in an agony for individuals whom they want to have saved, their friends, relations, enemies. They will not only be urging them to give their hearts to God, but they will carry them to God in the arms of faith. 
with strong crying and tears, beseech God to have mercy on them and save their souls from endless burnings. I love how the old preachers used to talk there. Let's go to number five, he says here. He says, it brings them to such, a, a, well, a, a revival breaks the power of the world and sin over Christians. It brings them to such a vantage ground that they get a fresh impulse toward heaven. They have a new foretaste of heaven and new desires after union with God. You see that? New desires after union with God. You want to you say, you want to ask what's going on at Asbury? That's it. There's new desires for union with God again, to know him intimately. Thus, the charm of the world is broken and the power of sin is overcome. Number six, when the churches are thus awakened and reformed, the reformation and salvation of sinners will follow. Their hearts will be broken down and changed. Very often, the most abandoned profligates are among the subjects. Harlots and drunkards and infidels of all sorts of abandoned characters are awakened and converted. The worst of human beings are softened and reclaimed and made to appear as lovely specimens of the beauty of holiness. So he's saying, you'll start to see the hard cases get saved. When we get right, he said, when a, a revival can be expected, a, re a revival may be expected when Christians have a spirit of prayer for revival. That is when they pray as if their hearts were set upon it. When Christians have the spirit of prayer for a revival, when they go about groaning out their heart's desire, when they have real travail of soul. So that's just a little bit. And if that's just Finney. There, there's many other people that have great definitions that are very similar, but he is, he was always very exhaustive. Now, I want to go and put up a verse here. Let's go to uh, Psalm 46. Psalm 46, 4 through 11. What does it say? There is a river. Somebody say there is a river. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy places of the tabernacles of the Most High. Um, just remember that. In fact, well, let's just keep reading this, chap this chapter right here a little bit. Because look, look at the context. What does it say very after that? There is a river, right? The streams that make glad the city of God. The very next thing it says, God is in the midst of her. That's the presence of God, God being in the midst. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. Um, let's go to John 7, 37. We'll start there. So what's this river he's talking about? Now, I believe there's a natural river. We talked about that coming out of Eden. But there's somebody say there's a spiritual river. And that is the Holy Spirit. And what is a river? What's unique about a river that's different, say, the pond? Moving. moving. Somebody say a river is moving. A river is moving. Let's, let's read this right here. It says, in, that, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So somebody say, the river is the Holy Spirit moving. Oh, yeah. Somebody say hallelujah. All right. Now I want you to go to Ezekiel 47 and just kind of hold yourself there. And we're going to read this. We're going to find out some things. But when I was at Asbury on Thursday afternoon just worshiping God, and after being there for three days in a row, it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we left Friday morning. But after being there a few days, I realized something. The Lord was like, this is the river. Let me, let me explain what I'm saying. How many of you have ever been canoeing or whitewater rafting? 
All right. And and I've gone down, I've canoed down the Coosa River, which is going to, comes down through Wetumpka and all that. When you do that type of things, how many of you know that you come to places in the river, it's just like a very gentle stream. There's no white water, there's nothing churning and moving and shaking. But it's still moving, but just ever so gently. And most people that are not like me kind of like that that easy stuff. I like the rapids. <laughs> and the wilder, the better for me. And I don't care if we turn over and, it's, and it just takes us on down through. But here's what the Lord told me. There are people in the kingdom of God, they can only handle the gentle part of the river. They ain't ready for the rapids yet. All right? Now, if they want to keep going and go deeper and further, at some point they're going to have to accept the rapids. But just because they only want the calm, gentle part does not mean they're not in the river. And that calm, gentle part, when God starts moving among our traditional church friends out there, the rapids are for us crazy Pentecostals because <laughs> we want more. We want it to hop, to bounce. We want to get a little adrenaline pumping. We want God to go full force. All right? Now, there are people that will say they want God to move full force and pour out his glory. But when he starts, they, they get scared or it doesn't fit in their tradition or their man-made doctrine, so they back up. Now, that's sad because one thing you need to know, if it's God's river and you're riding in it, he will keep you safe in it. You understand? Know it's when you get out of his river and get into some murky stream that's full of contemplative mysticism and Hinduism and Buddhism and Roman Catholicism and all that isms. All, it's an ism river. Don't get in the ism river. But if you're in the river of God, you can trust God. He's going to take care of you. See, we can say Asbury right now and what's beginning to spread to these college campuses. It's happening up here at Sanford University in Birmingham. They're starting to do the same thing. It's that gentle part of the stream. But now that stream is trying to take them somewhere. The question is, is where they keep going, are they going to paddle to the side and pull their boat out? But that's with anybody. I've watched God begin to move for real in Pentecostal and charismatic churches. And the pastors say, no, we're not going any further than this. It happened to two churches in Montgomery. I watched God, God get them in to the real river and the Holy Spirit starting to move. And if you go on down this direction a little bit more, we're going to get into some deeper things of the revival, some deep repentance some Christians, prodigals returning home. Some people getting delivered from demons. Some people getting healed. The unsaved coming to church because they're hungry for something. We're going to get to where it gets, it gets a little shaky. You have witches come in. And homosexuals come in. And Satanists come in. And how are you going to handle all that? And you know, a lot of people start coming. It becomes a challenge just to keep toilet paper in the bathrooms. You think that's, that's, that becomes a problem. You better have me invested in a toilet paper company. <laughs> but don't say, you know, there's Pentecost saying, well, it's not a real revival if it's not the rapids. And then you got... Baptist, I mean, you got your Baptist traditional hard, you know, your hardcore one saying, oh, if anything, if anybody speaks in tongues or anybody falls on the floor, it's not of God. And some of them are even saying now, I don't believe it's a revival because of this or that. Baptist folks. I heard one Baptist guy, did you get the video? It's called Demon Cast Out at Asbury. But there's a Baptist guy that I guess he set himself up to be the guardian of all creation. 
And I listened because I was listening to people's different response about Asbury. And I think he went for like a couple of hours one afternoon or something. And one of the things he said that he was like, he said, well, here are the good things and here are the bad things. And to him, one of the bad things were, I think there's charismatics coming in there. <laughs> Pentecostals coming in. And they're going to hijack this thing. Or, you know, we can't. He said, the good thing is there's no tongues or anybody falling down to the power of God. To him, that's a good thing. To me, I'm like, God, do what you want to do, right? Did you find it? You got to look at it, it. Recent upload. Oh. Well, it's in there. I don't know what file, but when you find it, let me know. I had to upload the stuff from my phone while we started the first song back there, but I'll show you in a minute. But anyway, let's read, let's read Ezekiel 47, and I'll get into this here, all right? Verse 1, afterward, here's Ezekiel it says, he brought me again into the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, and for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate, utter gate by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, uh, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me in the water, or through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. Somebody say, waters were to the ankles. All right, you got it. And then he says, and again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. Somebody say, to the knees. And he measured through, and the waters and the and the waters were to the loins. Say waters to the loins. Verse five. After he measured a thousand, it was a river. Somebody say it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Now, I know this is a vision, and this is a thing about the river that's going to proceed from the temple, the new temple, the new Jerusalem when after the second coming of Jesus. But there is a principle here. He didn't have to give us this little uh, story of water to the ankles and then to the knees and then to the loins and then waters moving incredibly fast over his head, waters to swim in, and that he couldn't pass over, meaning it was so powerful he couldn't pass by it. He couldn't overcome it. He was swept away with it. All right? But not in a bad sense. Now, I'm going to give you some things of what I believe these things represent here. Let's look about waters to the ankles. I remember John Kilpatrick said on that Sunday morning that Father's Day of 1995 when the Brownsville Revival started, he said he probably couldn't have been in a worse place spiritually than anybody. He said that his, you know, his mother had just passed away and he was quite the mama's boy. And he was so, uh, you know, still mourning his mother's death. He was so dry in dealing with, he had a lot of church issues that he dealt with for, for weeks leading up to that. He said when Steve Hill got there and, you know, his wife Gloria had gone to Toronto and God had really touched her there in Toronto. So Steve had gone to England, a revival that had broken out in England. And he said they were both sitting at the, te at the table talking about how powerfully God touched them and how just excited they were and how God's moving and God's going to move. And he said, I, w I just wanted to basically, he's like, I want to strangle both of them. He was just not, ha he was not <laughs> happy camper. And he said he was so depressed and grieving his mom's death and just so worn out. He had pastored the church for 14 years up to that point. They had been praying fervently for two years for revival. And he said that, uh, in fact, he said it was Father's Day the next day. He said, you know what? I, I don't even want to preach. Steve, you preach. He said, for me, you know, pastors of big churches, they don't give up holidays like Father's Day and Mother's Day. But he said he just couldn't do it. And he said that morning he got up, he thought about not going, just calling in sick. Think about this. The day the revival started. I've felt like that at times. 
He said, but he couldn't because he remembered that he had to give he had to give a, a gift to some the mother and father of the day, and he had to present it. And he's like, ah, I get dressed and go to church. He said that he had had up to this point there had been some ministers that came in. He said, and they would start saying, God's touched me, God's moving, we're having revival in our meetings. He said, and I'd invite them to the church, and it was counterfeit, it was fake, it was empty. He said, it was so discouraging. He said, because our church, he said, we were so hungry and thirsty for the real move of God. And John Kilpatrick, I give him credit, back in that day, boy, he'd put them out quick. He'd be like, nah, mm -mm, we're not going that out of the road. Well, Steve, he said, Steve started <laughs> preaching, and he said, I was irritated with him because he wouldn't be still. He said, like, Steve kept saying, God's going to touch you this morning. God's going to touch you this morning. And he said he was getting a little irritated with him. Well, he said, of course, Steve preached, and Steve preached for a while. He said, and then Steve gave an altar call. He said, and all these people came forward, and, he was, and he's like, I'm thinking, Steve. It's Father's Day. These people want to go have dinner and lunch with their families and do their family thing. Just let them go home. Until Steve started praying for people and people started being touched. And not many people fell in the floor. You know, the church already had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't about pushing tongues or pushing people falling in the floor or wanting that to happen. Steve just started praying for people. I, he just walking up, just barely putting his hand on their head, just like that, just putting the hand on their head. And God started moving. And that ro revival anointing that they had hungered and asked God for and thirsted for and got touched with in other places, God began to move. And John Kilpatrick was like, oh, gosh, now i got to go pray for a 1,000 people. <laughs> he was just like that on the platform. God's starting to move in his church, and he's like, he ain't recognizing it. It's real because he's like, had so much counterfeit come by or so many that, that was just hype. And he said, he said, I'm sitting up there, and he said, I stepped down one step off the platform to go pray for people. He said it was like a river hit me in the ankles. He said my knees kind of buckled, and I almost went down. And he said there was kind of like the people were still holding back in his congregation a little bit. When the Spirit hit him, he said, folks, this is it. This is the real thing. Get in it. He fell over backwards on the platform power under the power of God. The power of God began to move in that place. I mean, I think it was a 90-year-old man got saved that morning. Think about that. But the power of God began to refresh Christians. Began to renew Christians' faith. They begin to have a fresh encounter with God. Kilpatrick's out the whole time. They pray for folks for hours and hours. They're praying for the people in the congregation. And God's starting to move and touch people. They had to carry John Kilpatrick, the pastor, home. Literally pick him up, carry him home, put him in the bed. I love this because he was, he was such a hindrance that morning. God just had to move him out of the way. <laughs> he said when he got up to go, because they had Sunday night services. You know, that used to be a tradition, Sunday morning, Sunday night. So he said that we're going to have Sunday night service. He said they were coming there, Dad. You know, he said my son came in there. He's like, we got to go. You got to get up and get ready. He's like, I'm getting up. He couldn't put his socks on. He's like trying to get it. Couldn't, can't get them on. His son has to help him get dressed. He is so overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, drunk in the Spirit. They go put him, to set him in his seat it, it, up on the platform. And you see him the whole time, he's just kind of leaned over like this. He said, the power of God was on me like that for days. He said, I couldn't have preached. Steve Hill had, Steve Hill, and they had to start having revival services every day. And they began, and then after several weeks of seven days a week, almost 24 hours a day, they finally adjusted their schedule to have revival services Tuesday through Saturday night, take off on Mondays. John Kilpatrick, the, the church would be reserved for the, the church family on Sunday mornings once they got in and visitors could get in because they wanted to maintain the church. And John Kilpatrick would preach to his church on Sunday morning. So they brought 
they brought order. They found a day of rest so they wouldn't wear themselves out. And Steve Hill, the main evangelist, would get Sunday and Monday off, you see? And this is how they maintained it, all right, and maintained, and God just kept moving. Now, I say all that because what do what the ankles represent, the, the feet to me? And I wrote this last night. All of this just poured in me last night about this. The ankles, the covering of the feet represent our walk with God and the beautiful feet that share the gospel. You see, this is where the Spirit moves, and this is where we, he begins to correct and renew our walk with God, just like Finney said. The first step in a revival is when Christians break down and start getting their walk right. But let me ask you something. Did God leave Ezekiel just up to his ankles? Somebody say we're going deeper. But see, this is also the place that once you get your walk right with God and you get your life right with God, you also, God wants to birth in you to share the gospel. For the preparation of the gospel of peace. Where, where is that? My feet are shod for the preparation of the gospel of peace. So you, you become, not just get your walk straightened out with God, okay? But you, you begin to say, Lord, I'm willing to walk. I'm willing to go and share the gospel to whoever, wherever, however you want me to. I will preach your word. I will, I will not be ashamed. I will not have my talent buried somewhere in the earth. I'm digging it up, and I'm going to go use it. That's the ankles. Then he said that he was brought through the waters, and the waters came up to his knees. Oh, let me tell you what the knees represent. Two things. The knees represent the bending. Evan Roberts of the great, great Welsh revival had this prayer that started the revival, basically, in Wales. He was on the floor groaning over his own issues, and he said, Lord, bend me. That talks about submitting to the will of God. All of your will, all of your plans, all of your ideas, all of your preconceived ideas, all of your traditions of men and doctrines of men, all of this stuff. You say, Lord, I submit to you, to your will, to your word, to the moving and leading of the Holy Spirit. I bend the knee. You are Lord. And this is bending the knee. You bend the knee to a king. You make Jesus Lord, master, king of your life. Nothing else rules. That's the knees. You get that straight. It's also the knees speak of kneeling in prayer. You began a real prayer life, if you don't have one especially. Or if the one you have, it goes deeper. It gets more intense. It starts to actually groan and grieve and care about lost people around you. There's actually begins to be tears while you're praying. Sometimes you need to ask you, when's the last time? You wept tears in prayer for somebody that was lost or hurting or deceived or demon-possessed. That's the knees. I wrote down here, the knees speak of kneeling, bowing, submitting to Jesus as Lord, Master, and King. This speaks of having a real prayer life in relationship with God. Some of you may be already to your knees. That's good. Somebody say we got to go deeper, though. The next one, the water, he took him through the waters and it came to his loins. What do we know about that area? The Bible says you girt, the, on the armor, your loins are girt about with truth. truth. Oh, this is where you began to deal with the lies and the deception of men, the false doctrines within the church. You began to move away from that. You get back to the Word of God. You get back to sound doctrine. See, Jesus is both the Word of God and the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the Word and the truth. Well, this book right here, he said, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. 
This is the washing of the water of the word. This is when you begin to read and study. This is when you begin to find out stuff like the pre-trib rapture is wrong. This is when you begin to find out once saved, always saved, no matter how I live, is a false doctrine. This is when we're going to find out that what God says about creation is how it is, not what NASA says. You see what I'm saying? This is when you begin to find out the truth. You, and you began to believe and accept the word of God over the words and doctrines and traditions of men. Because the doctrines and words and tradition of men make the word of God none effect. So if the word of God is going to have an effect in you and an effect in the church and effect in people around you, it's got to be the unadulterated truth of the word of God, not mixed in with man's foolishness. This is important. The truth about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The truth about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The truth about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You accept the Bible as the inspired, infallible Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. I'm going to tell you, you, you're not in waters up to your loins if you still think, well, I believe some of the Bibles inspire God's Word, but some of it didn't. No, friend. Or, oh, you know, all that's just symbolic stuff about creation. It ain't got nothing to do with being real. You hear what I'm saying? See, you think about the great Re the Reformation, which was a great revival. What was it? It was a breaking away from the doctrines, the false doctrines and traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. And moving into real faith according to the scriptures. No more praying to Mary. No more rosary beads. No more paying indulgences. No more masses. No more, you know, sacraments that I have to go through. Roman Catholic sacraments that I have to go through to be saved. No, we're saved by grace through faith. A relationship with God. Being born again. They moved from the false doctrines and traditions of men of the Roman Catholic Church back to the Bible way of being saved. And God honored that. And the Spirit of God moved mightily. But guess what? Even men within the Reformation that went the right way finally got down the river a little bit and took their canoe out. They could have went deeper. I wrote here, Lawrence, this refers to the area where the Ephesians speak about being covered by the girdle of truth. This speaks of receiving deeper truths of the Bible. This represents the Acts 2, that once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, once they had preached and won souls, they were preaching the gospel again and repentance. Then it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles. Truth. You don't throw truth out. You don't throw biblical sound doctrine out the window. See, this is why a step. The next step from God hitting you in the ankles and getting you to get your relationship and get a real relationship and have a new encounter with God and start your walk right and get a real prayer life. And, a real, and they're getting that. they got a real worship life going on now. But the next step is it's going to have to come up to the loins. Truth. The loins is also the place of reproduction. And if we're going to produce real converts, we're going to have to preach real truth, biblical truth, sound truth. Not Methodist doctrine, not Baptist doctrine, not Presbyterian doctrine, not false doctrines in the Pentecostal and Charismatic Church. The Bible doctrines, sound doctrine. What did, what did Paul tell Timothy? He said, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, for in doing so you will save yourself and those that hear you. This is how important this is. The beautiful thing about Brownsville was that Steve would preach sound doctrine every night. And I know it because I was there night after night after night. I would marvel at the man coming up with sermon after sermon after sermon. And they would all be about Jesus. They would all be about repenting, getting his forgiveness, being born again. Or the prodigal coming home. <clears throat> I never saw him preach anything false. <clears throat> it was amazing. And the focus was on truth, preaching, sound doctrine, the truth, and getting 
the lost saved and the backslider home. And you know what Paul told the Galatians? Paul told the Galatians, he said, I travail in birth again a second time over you because they were falling away. They were falling back into the Torah movement. And he was like, I'm having to travail in birth again. I'm having to birth you again back into the, the truth. But see, this is what we talk about when he talks about travailing in prayer. It's like a pregnant woman going through her pain and agony to bring forth that child. This is how we bring forth new converts. And in a true revival, like Finney said, sinners will be converted and Christians will return from their backslide. Folks, you want a revival in our church, in our town, then you got to be a revival. You hear me? This was back there while we were worshiping the Lord. It was like, tell them they must individually be the example of a revival. And if enough of us are a revival, then we'll have a corporate revival. Then we'll have a citywide revival. Then we'll have a statewide revival. You get what I'm saying? It will spread. True revival spreads, too. And then he said this. I'm going to read on. Well, I said about the loins. I said, this is the place of apostolic revival preaching, being established in sound doctrine. This is the place where you turn loose of the false doctrines of men and denominations that have made the word of God in an effect. Jesus violated their traditions and man-made doctrines. He taught things different and angered the religious establishment. And I say right now, that if you get to this spot, now the, the real religious establishment hates, the, they hate it getting to the ankles. They really hate it getting to the knees. But they really, really, really hate it getting to the loins. Because that's when they start getting cast aside for the real thing. You know why the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus? It was simple. He made their religion look dead and empty and nothing they were irrelevant. And instead of going, you know what? Let me drop this dead, irrelevant religion full of the doctrines and traditions of men. Let me drop this and follow the revival that Jesus, Jesus was a revival. I mean, Jesus came into a religious system that was dead. It was the correct one, but it was dead. And instead of moving with him and changing, the, they wanted to kill him. We got to get rid of the problem because the problem makes us look like fools, hypocrites. This guy makes us look like whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. That's why churches that are dead, pastors and theologians, hate revival. They hate the Spirit of God moving. Because they've put all of their pride and religious superiority into their doctrines of divinity. <laughs> and their theological seminaries. <laughs> and their big houses from their big salaries as professors of these elite institutions. But God's not moving. And I don't have a problem with getting an education in the Bible. But when you're, you, you turn against the very things the Bible says, is the Spirit of God moving? Or you fight against that. I got no use for you. I don't care how many doctorates you have. A river. The next thing he says, the last one was a river that got so deep that it could not be passed over. Waters to swim in. This speaks of an outpouring of God's glory that's so strong and deep and abundant that it cannot be ignored or passed by without it affecting you. And when I say that without it affecting you, meaning it's going to be so in your face. It's going to be so obvious that God is moving. That God's going to make you pick sides. 
See, what was beautiful is it was you could not ignore. You could say, oh, well, I'm not charismatic. I don't like the speaking in tongues. I don't like people falling out in the floor in the spirit of God. I don't like that. So Brownsville's the devil. It's of the devil. But when you see thousands and thousands of people night after night run to an altar weeping because of the conviction of sin, repenting of their sin, asking Jesus to forgive their sins and wash their sins away. When you see that, when you hear the testimonies, every Friday night they did baptisms and people would give their testimonies. Yeah, I stopped smoking weed. I stopped drinking. I stopped going to the bars. One of the, one of the miracles that happened at the Brownsville Revival there, it was in Pensacola, Florida, Playboy or Penthouse. One of them was down there doing a photo shoot on the beach for the magazine. And the, the Playboy bunnies, whatever, they got in a car, a, a cab one night and said, take us to the hottest place in town. Cab driver took them to the revival. <laughs> Dropped them off. They all got saved that night. The sheriffs would arrest somebody committing a crime. And before they took them down to the jail cell, they would drive them and make them sit through the revival services in handcuffs. I remember seeing them somehow handcuffs up against the wall. <laughs> they couldn't ignore Brownsville. And it got real easy because you start hearing the pastors and the ministers, the famous ones across the country began to either curse it, speak against it, or dive into it. I'll tell you one of the worst ones, John MacArthur. I can't stand that guy. First of all, he's a hardcore Calvinist. He's got so many errors that he teaches, and he's so worshipped by the dead church. He is worshipped. And he wrote a book during that time, Charismatic Chaos. Basically, if you flinch wrong, Ted, in church, it's the devil. <laughs> can't be God moving. You can't have that. And all this stuff about the gift of tongues is not for today because you said the Bible says tongues will cease. Yeah, when does it say it will cease? You got you to gotta take the Bible in context. 1 Corinthians 13 says when we see him face to face, there will be no need for them. Has Jesus returned yet? So the tongues have not ceased. It's not complicated. It takes a theologian to, to confuse you on the matter <laughs> and teach you wrong. But this is the place where, let, let me tell you, and I shared it last week. I've been in meetings. The glory of God was so strong. You didn't want to leave. You didn't care if it was. God baptizing you in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You didn't care if it was just waves over your body and you were trembling and shaking. You didn't care if it was people falling in the floor. We used to even laugh. It's like, we, we, don't just, we need catchers. We need cover. You know, people would cover women up with the things. We need, ca we need catchers, covers, and stackers. We had so many people hitting the floor. But see, this is the place where you don't quench the Spirit of God. Not that mean you don't watch out for counterfeit people coming in and trying to do stuff wrong. But you don't quench the Holy Spirit. You don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This is the rapids. This is the level five. What's that river in Tennessee? Yet you better hold on tight. The Coe River. Those rapids are level five. You better, have, you better be holding on. But, folks, that's where it gets fun. That's where it gets real. That's where this is, this is the place. This is the place that just supernatural stuff begins to happen. I said, this is the place. You, you can't pass this one by without it affecting you. Because there's a, such a demonstration and manifestation of gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. The water level of the ankles. Now, listen to this. The water level of the ankles and the knees and the loins still allowed you to stand on your own two feet allowed you to have a little control but in a sense you're resisting the current still a little bit even though you're in it you're still resisting the current the full current of where the river wants to take you but when it over when, when you get to the waters that are to swim in the waters that are above your head where your feet can't touch the bottom you're completely surrendered 
you're no longer in control. You're letting the river take you. They used to, I remember John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill saying, how do y'all do this night after night after night? They said, we stop resisting the current. We just let the river take us where it wants us to go. And think about that. Instead of swimming you, in a river, you can just chill out, and it'll take you. It'll, it'll, it'll take you with it. I've been in many rivers. And it's fun. It's fun to go with it. Can't swim against it. I don't care how much you swim against it. You don't get anywhere, and you just wear yourself out. Let me tell you, these anti-revival people, anti-Holy Spirit people, anti-gifts of the Holy Spirit people, anti, oh, we can't have anything different happen. They're swimming against the current. They're just going to wear themselves out. And see, they'll be the ones, they're the ones that have shut down revivals. I remember, I remember Charles Finney talked about a revival he saw. He said a young man started preaching this church, and the power of the Holy Spirit just fell. And people started flooding to the church, and people were getting saved, and, and he was preaching some, some strong, you know, fire and brimstone, sinners in the hands of an angry God type sermons, passionate young man, loved the Lord. And God's moving, power of the Holy Spirit, people are getting saved, Christians are under conviction and repenting. Finney's like, it was powerful. He said, and then the deacon board. Somebody said, oh, you mean the demon board. The deacon board said, you know, this is a little too exuberant for us. It's a little too emotional. It's a little too strong it's not really the showing the love of god and so we don't want this young man preaching anymore but we'll keep the revival services going no you won't because when that young man walked out the door the holy spirit walked out the door with him see when the spirit of god is moving when the river is moving it's not your way it's his way and you don't get to say who does what where. That don't mean there'll be leaders that oversee to protect, not to interfere. There's a difference. You hear me? And let me show you something. You can see this pattern. Somebody say, ankles, knees, loins, waters to swim in. You see this pattern every time you turn around. Let's look at Jesus. Let me, let me just give you this real quick. Jesus, ankles, water baptism with John. He's called the Lamb of God. That's where it begins. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. That was the beginning. Just the trickle. This is when the disciples began to follow him. Just the start. This was, they began their walk with Jesus. And Jesus Starts and he goes and he hangs out with them a little bit. But then Jesus knees. Where's Jesus? Does Jesus go immediately and start preaching all over the country and doing miracles? No. 40 days. The Spirit of God leads him 40 days to fast and pray and be tempted of the devil in the wilderness. This is the knees. This is when he is bending to the will of God. This is when he's getting prayed up. Fueled up. This is when he's learning in his flesh how to resist the devil. Because Jesus, though he's God Almighty, he still was in a human body. And it said that he had to learn through the things which he suffered, yet without sin. And then what does it say? To the loins. When he comes out of the wilderness, after 40 days and 40 nights of prayer, and fasting, Jesus comes out, and it says he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit and began to teach. And what was the first words that came out of his mouth? Repent and believe the gospel. First thing he said, he begins to teach and preach the truth, truths that they didn't want to hear. The religious establishment didn't want to hear the truth. 
I remember Jesus when he goes to Nazareth that first time and he reads, he reads Isaiah. This is the beginning. And he reads Isaiah where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointing me to preach the gospel, to set the captives free. And he's reading that passage. And he hands it back to him and says, all the eyes are fixed on him. They're amazed at the, at the grace. And what they're talking about is the anointing was on him. It was something different this time. And Jesus said there were many, pro, uh, many widows in the days of Elijah. But he was only sent to the Gentile woman. Uh-oh. He said there were many, many widows in the days of Elisha during the famine. But he was only sent to one Gentile woman. Absolute Bible truth. What happened? They got so angry, they picked him up, grabbed a hold of him, and was going to throw him off a cliff. This is what happens. During a revival, there will be preaching and teaching straight from the word, but it'll go against the total religious establishment. They'll hate every word of it. You can prove it to them in Hebrew and Greek and context and po proper hermeneutics and everything. And they still say, nope, we will not have it. That's when Jesus started teaching and preaching. Say the waters to swim in. What happened that next? Word began to spread. And it says, even in the first chapter of Mark, the multitudes came, and he healed them all. Woo! That's when you're in the waters, the deep waters. Do I hear me? That's when the miracles and the power just starts flowing. Do you know that many, many nights, I remember the Brownsville Revival, a lot of times nobody talked about healing. Nobody laid hands on anybody for healing. The sermon didn't talk about healing miracles. And people would just be getting healed. In the, I think one of the biggest things people got healed of that I kept hearing testimonies of was brain tumors. It was unreal. But it wasn't somebody going, hey, we need to pray. Anybody got a brain tumor, we'll pray for you. God just started healing people. I remember at times they would share x-rays of two people full of tumors, and then they get prayed for at the revival, and they'd bring the x-rays back. They're all gone. Book of Acts. Let's look at the book of Acts. Ankles, the church. I said that a minute ago. Finally understood their purpose of the cross and the gospel message. Remember, after Jesus was resurrected, and he sat down and explained the scriptures to them, and he did on the, on the road to Emmaus. They finally understood about his suffering, about his atoning death, that he had to die for our sins. That's the ankles. Somebody say the ankles. So they got their walk corrected. Peter repented of his betrayal. So this was the time period things were getting right. They, they had to replace Judas. So they got back 12 apostles. And so the next step, the knees. They go into continual prayer in obedience until they get filled with the Holy Spirit, until the day of Pentecost. That's the knees. The loins. They accept the truth about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in other tongues. They, they begin to preach. Day of Pentecost, th thousands gathered. Peter stands up and preaches. You killed the Prince of Life, the Messiah, whom God has raised from the dead. You killed him. You went and brethren, what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So they begin to preach the truth, speak the truth. And guess what? 3,000 people were converted that day. Reproduction. And then the deep water hit. After, Jesus, after, after Peter and John heal the man at the temple gate, the lame man, said, the name, with silver and gold have we none, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And when that miracle was seen by everybody, the religious establishments go, oh, well, we got to shut that down. So they, they threw him in prison, in jail. But let me tell you what happened after this. The angels come and get him out. 
right? They get out of jail. They go right back to the temple preaching. But the word got out. And so, so many people began to come. That folks, listen to this. Now, you want to talk about this was the New Testament church. This was normal. So many people were coming that they just laid them in the streets. And the shadow of Peter passing over them is when they got healed. This is when folks drop dead in church from lying to the Holy Spirit. This is when the crippled walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. And you say, oh, this can't, that doesn't happen anymore. Folks, it happened in 1955 in a meeting in Birmingham, Alabama. Who was it? What was his name? Why did it just say? Uh, A.A. Allen. Big tent, 10,000 seat tent full of people. And I heard R.W. Schambach share this the other day again because R.W. Schambach had been his worship leader. Or back then they called it song leader. And, then, and he said that there was a little boy brought to the revival. And they, at that point they didn't know about him. His mama came there with just enough money pretty much to get there, have some food, and get home. She had $20 to get back home. From, to Tennessee. He said that this boy was born with 19 different diseases. He didn't, his eyes, he was blind and swirled, just swirls, just gray, you know. Said his feet were crippled. Uh, he had blood disorders, heart problem. I mean, in fact, he was living. He'd never spoken. He was deaf and mute. And A.A. Allen didn't know he was at the revival. Uh, R.W. Schambach said he ran into this woman and said, well, you know, I'll tell the man of God to pray for him. But he said, I never did. He said they, they took up an offering. And he said that in the offering, they just said, you know, of course, give what you can give. But, you know, sometimes you got to you got to take a step of faith. And so this woman, in her faith, in her desperation, gave her last 20, the $20 that she needed to get home by the train back to Tennessee. She put it in the offering plate. When they finished taking up the offering, R.W. Schambach said, A. Allen immediately closed his eyes and was in the spirit. And he said, I see a baby being born. 19 different diseases, blind, deaf, mute, crippled, never spoken. The woman is just weeping her eyes out. Right? She carries that baby up there. He takes the baby in his arms. And he says, everybody bow your head, close your eyes, let's pray. R.W. Shambach said, I'm not closing my eyes. I'm going to watch him pray. <laughs> he said, and I was right next to him. He's right up next to him. He said, R.W. Shambach, I mean, A. Allen began to pray in the name of Jesus. He said, I watched as eyes begin to swirl. And poof, perfect two little eyes. I watched feet. Straighten out. He said, I watched the man of God drop this baby on the ground, and it ran and said, Mama, for the first time ever. He said, when that happened in that 10,000-seat tent, they had, a, they had a section full of people on stretchers so sick they had to be carried in. They had a section of people in wheelchairs. Everybody in the wheelchair stood up healed. Everybody in the stretcher section got up healed. You don't tell me we put a limit on what God can do. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. We limit him. We quench him. We get an unbelief. We get in doubt. We get into theology that's, that's man-made. This can happen. See, there was a great healing revival in America most people don't even know about between 1947 and 1957. God was moving in healing. And boy, did the, there's the part of the church, the dead church, hated every, bit, every minute of it. And guess what? There were some charlatans and some false people scattered about within that movement. But there was true ones.
We, we, you know, when Jesus went to Nazareth, remember when he went to Mark 6, when he goes to Nazareth, and it said he could do no mighty work there because of his unbelief. But what we forget, because of their unbelief, he, what, what we forget, it said, but he did heal a few sick folk. He just didn't do any big stuff. See, and I think that's where a lot of us, our faith has been. Well, he'll do a little, some little things. But we don't realize that we can be in a river of the Holy Spirit where it's so deep and it's so powerful and it's so beyond us. See, that's what I want to see. I don't want to get satisfied with the ankles or the knees. We need them. We need, we need the ankles first. We need the waters to the knees. We need the waters to the lawn. We need, but we need the deep water. We need the river of God in our lives. We need it in the church. We need it in America. And it's not about hype and show. It's about humility, hunger, repentance, getting serious with God about our lives and our commitment to him, our prayer lives, our worship time. Are you hungry? And, folks, this is a place, you know, if we go and read, they want to they hate on manifestations, supernatural manifestations in revival. But folks, I got it right here. I got the list of all the, all the manifestations that happened. Just let's, let me read a little of this. Falling under the power of the Spirit. The phenomenon of falling under the power of the Spirit occurred in the revivals of Jonathan Edwards. His assessment was that a person may fail bodily strength due to Fear of hell and the conviction by the Holy Spirit due to the foretaste of heaven. John Wesley recognized falling to the ground as a manifestation from God and records many such instances in his ministry. In fact, George Whitfield criticized Wesley for permitting the phenomena until it began happening in his own meetings. The Kentucky revivals of 1800 and 1801, which involved Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, was replete with similar demonstrations, in the early 1800s, the revivals led by the Methodist circuit writer, preacher Peter Cartwright, who was converted in the Kentucky revivals, were often accompanied by people falling under God's power, including some Baptists. Finney's ministry was also frequently manifested fainting or swooning, what he called falling under the power of God. The Welsh revival of 1859 was accompanied by swooning as waves of power often overwhelmed people. In the 1860s, Andrew Murray's church started to speak out against people who began to shout and cry and swoon in a revival in his church until a visitor from America told him about similar manifestations in American revivals. Decades before the holy evangelist Mar Mariah Woodworth Edder's uh, involvement in the Pentecostal revival, many people in her meetings fell under the power of the Spirit, including Carrie Judd, an early leader in uh, the CMA, uh, Moody's associate R.A. Torrey testified of people falling under power of God due to conviction of sin. Torrey himself fell under the power of the Spirit when baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Presbyterian ministry missionary, rather, Jonathan Goforth, makes reference to his, uh, in his book, By My Spirit, to the phenomena occurring in his revivals. Instances of falling under the power of the Spirit also occurred periodically in the CMA meetings. Um, for two decades before Azusa Street. In 1885, A.B. Simpson, the founder of the C and M.A., received what he would call a word of knowledge that someone was resisting the Lord. A woman responded, responded saying it was her. She came forward, and as Simpson anointed her for healing, she was overcome, falling under the power of the Spirit, seemingly unconscious for about a half an hour, and she received healing. I mean, I could go on and on. I didn't even know this. Holy laughter occurred in early evangelical and holiness circles, Jonathan Edwards described the reaction of some who were converted in the Great Awakening Revival, quote, their joyful surprise caused their heart, as it were, to leap, so that they uh, have been ready to break forth into the laughter, tearing often at the same time, issuing like a flood, intermingling with loud weeping. E.M. Um, Bounds, 
records Wesley saying, The power of God came mightily upon us so that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. Charles Finney wrote that after he testified about his experience of being baptized in the Spirit, an unusually serious elder of his church fell into a most spasmodic laughter. It seemed as if it was impossible for him to keep from laughing from the very bottom of his heart. Um, the accounts just continue on and on. Oswald Chambers, you know, the Baptists loved Oswald Chambers, also recorded his diary in April 19th, 1907. Last night we had a blessed time. I was called down by the teachers to pray and anoint a lady who wanted healing. As we were doing it, God came so near that upon my word, we were laughing as well as praying. How utterly uh, stilted we are in our approach to God. Oh, that we lived more up to the light of all our glorious privileges. Chambers evidently believed that laughter could be a sign of revival. Um, and yet that's mocked today. And he, he goes on to talk about spontaneous dancing for joy, physical sen sen uh, sensations, uh, trembling, shaking, convulsions. He said, along with swooning, such phenomena of trembling, shaking, and convulsions occurred in the ministry of Jonathan Edwards and the Great Awakening. Quakers received their name because they shook. At the outset of the Welsh Revival in 1904, Evan Roberts experienced a manifestation of shaking on several occasions. In the spring of 1904, Evan found himself, as it were, on the Mount of Transfiguration in his own home out in the countryside. His loving Heavenly Father revealed himself to his child in an amazing, overwhelming manner, filled his soul with divine awe, and these special seasons, every member of his body trembled until the bed was shaken. And we could go on and on with this. God can do what he wants to do. Yeah, what's, what's not told a lot about Evan Roberts in the Welsh Revival was that for like, what did he say? It was like a month or two that in the middle of the night, God would call him up into heaven and for real. Like he wouldn't do anything and they would commune together. And then that's why 250,000 people got saved. You say, well, that just sounds strange. Did not Moses talk with God like that? And yet the Bible says the New Testament is a better covenant with better promises. I'm saying all that to say, don't quench, grieve, or resist the Holy Spirit of God. You say, well, how do I know if something's God? Stay in your Bible. Make sure you're reading and know your Bible. And remember the times when you got born again. The Spirit of God that you felt come in and regenerate your dead spirit and wash your sins away. That encounter with Jesus, that peace, that power, that love you felt when you were born again, it's going to be similar when he moves. How, whenever he moves, it's the, it's, that same, it's the same Holy Spirit. And I know when it's him. See, I, I, I remember those days. I remember. And, and look, I'm not picking on my Baptist, Methodist, because there's dead churches now in every denomination. And some of, uh, some of it in Pentecostal churches, the Holy Spirit is not there at all. It's hype and emotions. I understand. And I understand why a lot of you are terrified to end up in a meeting like with Todd Bentley leading it. I understand that. I am too. Because I know where he's gotten off. Would I like to see him get back on track and get into the real thing? Yes. I don't hate the man. Would I like to see John MacArthur? Quit denying the gifts of the Holy Spirit and say, yeah, God can still move today and the gifts are still for today and that's what the Bible teaches. Would I like to see him come to the truth and not resist and quench and grieve the Holy Spirit while he thinks he's so superior to everybody else? Yeah, I'd like to see that change. You know, I'm going to end with this. Everybody know how, knows how anointed the prophet Elijah was, right? And his protege, the, the one picked to fill his spot, was Elisha, right? And everybody knows, you know, I, I, I love Pentecostal ministers. You know, you can't give what you don't have. Oh, double a portion of the anointing. Well, you don't have a portion yet. So I don't know what you're trying to give a double portion. I, I can't stand some of the stupid stuff that goes on. What was the purpose of that story? See, why did Elisha want a double portion? Well, some people say, well, he was just greedy. 
He just wanted to be more of a hot shot than Elijah was. And this is what the Lord told me. One day I'm reading this story. And the Lord told me, he said, he said, Elisha knew he needed double because he knew he wasn't the man Elijah was. That he wasn't the man of faith that Elijah was. That he, he didn't feel that he lived up to what Elijah was. And he said, Lord, I'm going to need more of you than he had because I'm not as good a man as he is. And see, to me, it's humble. It's, it's really the opposite. There's a lot of Pentecostals and charismatic preachers running around like peacocks. Look at me. You know, just, and that is not at all what it's about. You should, you should and this is why a lot of them end up marrying their secretaries, divorcing their wives, <laughs> because they're peacocks. Instead of going, I'm made of flesh. I ain't nothing special. In fact, that evil part of my flesh can rise up. And if I'm not humble and I'm in pride thinking I got it all together, I don't care what kind of anointing you got on you to preach. It can all come crashing and burning down upon you if you think for one second that you got it all together and you're it, you're God's, you know, all that in a bag of chips. No, folks. I know what present Dean is capable of without the Spirit of God helping me live this life and me submitting to that and resisting the flesh and fighting the devil. I know if I just give up and give in, I'm going to be wicked because that's the way the flesh wants to pull you. And so for anybody to think, I got this all together, Oh, me, I, I, I defeated old Slewfoot. No, you hadn't. No, no, Slewfoot. <laughs> Slewfoot's been around a long time. He's smarter than you. He's more powerful than you. And he knows how to find the spot to slip in and take you down. And the moment you think, I'm the man. Ain't no man of God like me. That's the, you just open the door, whoop, and Slewfoot now is living with you. <laughs> and you think he's an angel. He's an angel of light. And you know what's amazing? God will bless those ministries. And I, I mean, the devil will help those, how to put, those ministries look successful. And they don't even realize that Satan has slipped in the back door. No, folks, I know I need the Spirit of God to fill me, to anoint me, to strengthen me, to help me, to guide me, to teach me, to correct me if I'm wrong somewhere. Please correct me. Don't let me get off track, Lord. I don't want to get off track. I tell him all the time, I know I could get off track. I know I could fall. I'm not invincible just because I'm a pastor, and none of you are either. No, none of us are invincible to temptation and being deceived or being attacked or fall and being knocked down or falling down or that's why you stay humble and say, Lord, I need you. I need more of you. I need less of me. I need more of you. Y'all hear me? This is revival, folks. That, that pattern, you could go look at, go, look, go, go read about any true revival of God, and you'll find that. The ankles, the knees, the loins, and the deep water. Now, a lot of them never got to deep water. But you'll find they were on their way. They just stopped somewhere. I've seen revivals stop. I've seen them start and then stop. But let's stand this morning. I want to do that song again, that Wickham song before we go. And I let it ride this morning, the music on the, the Facebook feed, because I wanted folks to hear that song, and I don't care if Facebook may silence the video or take it down. Huh? The last one we did. I thought it was Wickham. I don't know. Whatever it was. What's the title of it? It's what? Oh, that's it. Okay. You know that song. Come on.
But here's what I want us to do before we do this song, before we leave. I want everybody to just bow your head, and I want you to pray this morning for the revival to begin, say, in me. Holy Spirit, fill me. I renew my dedication. I renew myself to seek you with all my heart, to pray and ask for your outpouring. I believe. As a church, as Fire and Grace Church, I believe if we do this, I believe now the season is, is, is now ready. The season is now right. And we can decide to get in the river, get in the canoe, and start going down the river. And it doesn't matter if it starts just a little gentle. That's fine. But I believe we all need to hunger and thirst and cry out to him in unity, uh, not for a little while until he pours his spirit out. And then I want y'all to begin to share the testimonies of what he's doing in your life. I'm going to let y'all share. God starts moving. I'm going to let y'all share your testimonies. I want to hear from you what God's doing in your life. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name for your Holy Spirit to have free course. God, in our church, in our homes, in our lives, in our jobs, our businesses, God, we want you to come. We want your spirit to move. We want to go deeper with you. We want to move with you. We want to flow with you. We want to move with the cloud of your presence. We want to move with the river of your spirit. God, we don't want to hold back. We don't want to resist. We don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. We don't want to cling to the traditions and doctrines of men. God, we want you. And like the song says, you don't owe us anything, Jesus. But you promised that the, the people that would obey you, you would manifest yourself to them. Lord, your word says in James that if we would draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And they prayed in the revivals that you would rend the heavens and come down, that your presence would be so strong. And when your presence is that strong, mountains shake. How much more people, buildings shook in the New Testament when you move. Lord, we pray for you to move in Fire and Grace Church. I, as, as the pastor, Lord, if I'm in the way by any way, Help me get out of the way. If I need to change anything, do something different, I pray you show me. I want the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our church, in Opelika, in Auburn, in Alabama. I pray for this. Lord, we pray. Send the fire of your Holy Spirit, Lord, beyond what we could ask or think, Lord. We want to go into deep waters with you, Lord. We want to be in the river. We know there's so much more. And, Lord, you want us to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost to be witnesses to you, to win the loss to you, Lord, a dying world to save. Lord, we want to be full of your power, not for selfish reasons, but, Lord, to do your will, to preach your word, to speak your truth. To see the brokenhearted healed. To see the rebels in hard cases crumble and tremble. To see people surrender their lives. To find the peace and the love and the forgiveness and the joy and the hope of eternal life only found in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now we pray this today. We pray this for our church. We pray this for our ministry school. We pray this. Right now for Asbury, for the revivals in different campuses now, pour out your spirit and your glory and your conviction and your fire and let this spread all over our country and let it go deeper. Let it go from the ankles to the knees to the loins to the deep water. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Hallelujah. Folks, I'm telling you, something new is beginning. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go. If you want to come back and eat, go get you something and come downstairs and eat. If you can't, make sure you hug some necks before you leave. Yes. Oh, and this next week we're going to be, we're going to have a good gathering group of people at uh, our long distance earth curvature test. That's going to be at uh, North Beach Park uh, in Fairhope, Alabama. That's next Saturday at 9 o'clock because we're going down Friday night and try something depending on the weather. It may it's supposed to be sunny and clear on Saturday. I hear there might be some rain on Friday night, so we may not be able to do a whole lot Friday night, but the main part is 9 o'clock because you want to get there as, uh, before the temperature gets too high. You'll see, but uh, everyone's welcome if you can come join us for that. Of course, we'll be coming back as soon as we're done for get ready for church the next day, uh, but we'll be doing that. And, of course, uh, Skyfall uh, 2023. Uh, I, you know, it's interesting because uh, the Lord led us to pick this verse here, this th about uh, the Lord coming like rain. And this was uh, long before this revival started breaking out. The Lord gave us the theme, the hunger for him to step down and come down like rain. And let me tell you something. When we were in Kentucky, did the rain come down? And I'm talking, and then the snow. We left in the snow. We started out in 64 degrees and pouring down rain for a whole day. I had to buy a, I had to buy a full uh, rain suit to stay dry. And then uh, packing up the truck to leave Friday, it was snowing. Snowed all the way through the mountains. Uh, yeah, it was coming down pretty good. But, uh, yeah, we got to experience spring and then torrential downpour and then snow, wintertime. Uh, so Kentucky's much like Alabama. Um, anyway, but uh, this June 2nd through the 4th, and like I said, be praying. Uh, registration is open, so go to skyfallconference.org and register now as you can. Uh, and tell your friends, look, our church family and our extended family out there that watch, share Skyfall uh, 23. I believe God's going to move in a powerful way. So uh, prepare for that. Amen. And um, pray that we'll find a building, maybe a temporary sanctuary, somewhere we can set up because we need more room. Uh, so we're going to do that here pretty soon. So anyway, uh, God bless all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for bearing along. I know I had a long message, but I, I, ha I had to get it all out today. Uh, all right. But uh, love every one of you. God bless you. And like I said, hug some necks before you leave.